a really lonely time standing up here and preaching to an empty room. And it's so good to catch up with you guys. I'm, I'm glad to see that you guys are healthy and social distanced and you brought your masks and your hands are clean and you guys are being all considered. I appreciate that so much. I want to wish a happy Father's Day to all you fathers. Of course, it was Mother's Day is usually a bigger deal to go out and eat than Father's Day. It's the, it's the busiest day for restaurants. Did you know that, Mother's Day? I don't know. Maybe it's the busiest day for axe throwing on Father's Day or something. I, I don't know. Uh, although we, we did that on Mother's Day last time. Anyway, I'm so glad that you guys are here. I feel much more comfortable sharing interpersonal things, just spouting off endlessly. No, I'm just kidding. No, don't do that. We're finishing up the book of 1 John today. We're in chapter 5. We're going to pick it up from verse 14. And it's the what, why, and who of prayer. That's the beginning section. And then there are some uh, we knows. And then there's a conclusion. So uh, if you guys would just pray with me as we ask the Lord to be with our hearts and minds. Father, this morning we come before you. And as we look into your word, we recognize your presence here with us. We know that you care for us, that you love us, and Lord, that you care for our souls, as well as our bodies and our minds and our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would touch us by your word, that you might touch some area of our life as we've been um, quarantined and struggling with the virus. We're glad to be back together, and I, I pray that you might increase our joy and you might encourage our hearts to be like you. So, Lord, here we are. We pray that you use us for your kingdom's sake as you build us up in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So as we go through, we're going to pick it up in Chapter 5. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that you should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. So we have a whole bunch of scriptures to go over, and some of it rather cryptic, like uh, sins unto death and secret things in which I'm so glad you guys came today because now you can learn something that maybe you didn't know before or maybe you already know. How many of you know the sin that leads to death? That's good. I'm going I'm to quiz you when the time comes. That'll be fun. Last week we ended with verse 13 of chapter 5 and it says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And John is very clear about telling us why he wrote the book and it's so that you might continue to believe and know that you have eternal life. And so the scriptures, all of them, are put there for our good and they're God's revealed will but he specifically says, the reason I wrote you this is so that you would know that you believe in the true Son, that you might see these hurdles that are to be jumped and realize that God is in your life and that you do know him and have a relationship with him and that you might continue to do so. So uh, that's the purpose of the book. And uh, I'm always convicted when I see the book, it says, read me on the front because I, I have 
lots of Bibles, and many of them do that. They collect dust. Well, he talks about prayer in the beginning, and he says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. Now, he's speaking to believers. Obviously, this is a, an epistle written to believers. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked for him. How many of you know that? Some of you. Okay. So you know that when you pray, God hears you, and when he hears you, that he answers your prayer. Just nod your head yes. Just follow me. So, first thing we're told is to ask. Well, it just seems like a silly thing that God would say that we should ask him for things. Because he knows everything. He knows every word that's on our tongue. He knows every thought that's in our mind. He knows everywhere we're going to go. He knows our first day. He knows our last day. He knows when our last breath will be, where it will be. He knows all of that. And it's already happening. So why would God play such a cruel joke and say, I'll do stuff for you, but you have to ask me. Doesn't it just seem a little, it makes me go, why would God ask me to ask? Well, it says here in Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13, Jesus explaining about prayer. He says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, and by the way, that's what Jesus said, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So Jesus' teaching here is we should ask, we should seek, and we should knock. So there's a responsibility on our behalf to actually take God at his word, believe what he says, and pursue God for those things that we should ask. Did you ever have God answer a prayer that you'd never really verbalized? I have. And I didn't realize, but it was a secret asking. You know, sometimes we can complain, right? We just go before God and say, you know, I wish I could make my bills this week. And he says, yeah, you're trying to, you, you, you're getting something somewhere with this? You know, this is the way he speaks with me. So, My son used to do this. He used to come to me. He said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to a friend's party. I said, oh, that's great. He says, yeah, I have to go buy a gift for this girl. It's her birthday. Wonderful. What are you going to get her? Well, Nothing. Well, how come? Well, I don't have any money. It's like, well, how much do you need? He goes, oh, I don't know, $10. I said, wow, that really sucks. <laughs> what are you going to do about that? And then he goes, and he just walks away. I'm, I'm wanting him to ask me. I'm waiting for him to ask me. I'm wishing he would ask me, but he doesn't ask me. And I wonder... Do we do that with God? Do we just complain at God and say, oh, I don't like the way you've been treating me. I'm not really well taken care of. Well, what is it that you expect? Well, I don't know. I just thought you loved me. I'm sure you never, <laughs> you never have that with God. Sometimes I do. But I've learned that God doesn't respond until I ask him. Because if he did everything without us asking, we wouldn't realize it was him doing it. And we would just take it for granted, right? Did you pray to God that you would wake up healthy today? And yet, look at you, you're here. And you're healthy. Did you thank God this morning? Did you get on your knees and did you weep? And did you say, I am not one of those people who died from the COVID. God, I thank you so, 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 so much. I can breathe, I can walk, I can talk, I can fellowship, I can worship. Thank you. And yet, if you're ever sick, and on the tail end of that sickness, you come out of it, you know what a blessing it is to be able to breathe and not have your nose dripping all over your face and, you know, all of that weirdness that happens when you're ill. And you just say, God, thank you so much. And you never appreciate something like you do when you've lost it, right? Like your freedom for the last three months. 
That's the way God works. He, he waits for us to ask him. Because then when we ask him and he provides, doesn't that do something inside of us? When a child asks a father for something and he provides him with the thing that is necessary, and God's not going to give you some kind of a, he's not going to play trick on you. He's not going to be all sarcastic like me. He's not going to be, you know, uh, playing jokes on you. He's going to do that, which is good for you. And you know that if you ask him for something, he's going to give you what's best for you, which is why sometimes he doesn't answer your prayers, by the way. So prayer. Number one, we're supposed to ask. We have this confidence before him that if we ask anything, like the celestial Santa Claus, that's the way we think of prayer, right? Like we're going to tell God what we want, and I read off the list. I, I want a BB gun, and I want, you know, and, and you go down the list of what you want from God, and that's what prayer is, right? Well, that's what some people think it is. But it says that we can ask anything. Um, it's not usually that very happy face that comes when child sits on Santa's lap. By the way, sociologists are saying you should not allow your children to sit on Santa's lap now. It's socially inappropriate. Is it? Anyway, sorry. I read too much. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, about anything. Don't be anxious for, uh, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understandings will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that the peace of God to guard over you is predicated by you praying about everything and not worrying about everything? So if you're worried and you don't have the peace of God, guess what? You didn't pray about everything. You didn't give it to the Lord. You didn't check with him. You took it upon yourself. Maybe you think it's your responsibility to take care of everything. Maybe you carry the burdens of the world on your back. No, not you good people, right? And yet, if you don't have the peace of God, probably you're carrying something you shouldn't carry. It might be a sin in your life. It might be a burden. It might be some unforgiveness. You're probably carrying something that you shouldn't be carrying because you weren't designed to carry it. But Jesus, however, was designed to carry it. And he went all the way to the cross and took the nails for you. So you don't have to carry it. You can not worry about anything, pray about everything, and then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Amen? So you don't have to be like this little guy, which is usually what happens. So we think of God like this celestial genie. You know, you rub the lamp and you tell God what you want and he gives it to you. And it almost sounds that way when you read the scripture. We know that he hears us. And, and when we pray, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we have those things that we've asked God for, right? And Jesus says, ask and seek and knock. Because all those who ask, receive. In fact, I guarantee you, every one of your prayers is answered. It might not be the way you like it. But every one of your prayers is answered. Amen. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's wait. Sometimes it's forget about it. That's a good answer, too. But if you think about this, this is such a tremendous privilege to be able to pray to God. And he says that like a good father, a father that's much more loving than any earthly father, by the way, this is the tie-in to Father's Day. I just realized that. I know, that's funny, right? I learn up here that God gives to us the Holy Spirit. How many of you want some more of the Holy Spirit? How would you like a charge, your soul charge? I do. I, I need that. I need, I need more of a conscience. I need a softer heart towards the needs of others. I need a sharper mind towards the things of God. I need to know more. I need to do more. And I, I just have this great sense of that. And I'm not going to be able to do it if I try to take a 10-ton rock, put it on my back, and carry it. It just won't be done. And I certainly won't do it joyfully. And I won't do it without wanting to be recognized or an appreciation plaque, you know, or something silly. So what do we do? We ask, and we seek, and we knock. And we ask God, and it says that we know that if we ask God for anything, did you know you could ask God for anything? Is there anything you can't ask God for? You can ask him for anything. I mean, you should be willing to hear no, but you can ask anything. And I wonder, do we pray big enough? 
do we realize how big and how loving and how good is our God that he wants to take care of us, that we pray for those things in faith, knowing that he loves us. And it all boils down to having a true understanding of God's love for you. And I don't know about you, but I haven't fathomed that quite yet. I haven't figured out where the bottom is of God's love. But when you understand more of how he loves you, it will change your prayer life. And it's not because you've earned it or you're good enough or, you know, you're finally getting to a place where God can use you and you worked out some of the major bugs of your life. It's not that. It's that God loves you and he loved you as you were. In fact, he sent his son to die for you while you were still yet a sinner and running away from him and in rebellion. So how much does he love you now that you're cooperating? It's something to consider. It's something certainly to, to pray about and ask God to give you an understanding of the depth of his love. So we now have this confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, and notice the little, it's like the little small stuff on the bottom of the page that you don't look at when you're signing papers. Oh, by the way, you only have this car for three days unless you give us $2,500 in cash. And, you know, you know, the little, the fine print or on the radio when the lawyer gets on and he goes, <laughs> and you go, what? It's okay. Forget about that. Actual results may vary, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's playing, praying according to his will. How many of you clearly understand every nuance of God's will for your life? Now, there's no hands up. I'm, I'm actually not surprised. Understanding the will of God is probably one of the greatest things that we as Christians have because sometimes we're very willing to do what God wants, but it, sometimes we feel like he's keeping it a secret. He's keeping his hand on it. It's hidden. You know, it's a little bit of a shell game. You're trying to figure out, God, do you want me to do this? Eh, okay, I'm not going to do that. Well, what about this over here? Eh, okay. This one. Eh, oh, God. Lord, what do you want from me? Now, I know you people never get there. I get there all the time. Matthew, Jesus tells us here in chapter 6, In this matter, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus taught that we should pray in God's will, that we should ask for God's will on earth as it is in heaven. By the way, that means that you're willing to cooperate with whatever God wants to do. Because if his will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven, what control do you have over everyone else around you? Zero. How much control do you have over you? 100%. And so when you say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it means I throw myself at your feet, Lord, I'm your servant, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. You tell me to jump, I'll say how high. That your will would be done here in heaven, in my life. Because this is a personal prayer, by the way, to your heavenly father. So we pray for God's will, and we need to be willing to do God's will. And this is what Jesus taught. But not only did Jesus teach this, but he also modeled it when he was in the garden, if you remember, in Matthew 26. It says, again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me, Pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. In other words, Lord, I, I really don't want to do this thing. I don't want to go to the cross and die for the sins of these rebellious people, but I will do it because you want me to do it. It's your will be done. And you see, Jesus prayed in the will of his Father. He knew what God wanted him to do, and he didn't want to do it. But he said, thy will be done. Thank God he did, right? Because yes. without that, we'd all be lost. So Jesus not only taught it, but he also modeled it as he was in the garden, as he prayed. You remember him going away three times, the disciples kept falling asleep, and he said, you know, pray that you don't enter into temptation. And that was actually a very important encouragement, because if you remember, uh, as soon as the guards show up, you know, Peter jumps to action, and he figures he's going to save God. Isn't that funny? And pulls out his sword and hacks an ear off. Thy will be done means we're willing to do his will and we're moving uh, in that direction of his will. So how can I know the will of God for my asking? How do you know what the will of God is when you pray? Because the scripture definitely says we shouldn't pray about everything, should we? 
It does say, should we pray about everything? I'm just testing you. We should pray about everything, right? But what is the will of God for us to pray? You know, I can pray for you, but what do I pray? God, I pray you'd bring them humility. That you might teach them patience. Do you know what I'm praying on you? I'm praying hardship, difficulty, adversity. Right? Because that's how that stuff grows, by the way. That's, that's the very soil in which patience grows, is hardship. So how do you know how to pray for somebody? You pray for God's blessings to be showered down on them. Maybe they got a problem with greed and self-centeredness, and that's not going to help them. Because all that's going to do is make them worse. And they'll run out of money real quick, and then you'll have to do it all over again. So how do you know God's will? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's found within the pages of your Bible. If you want to know what God's disclosed will is, you should look at his disclosed will, which is the scriptures. We get 66 books. It spans the ages, and it's definitely a bestseller. It says, we have the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And by the way, God hearing means God acting. When God hears you, he acts on it. Otherwise, he doesn't hear you, by the way. So if you ever read that in the scriptures, that's what that means. And we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. In John 15, verses 7 and 8, it says, If you abide in me, this is Jesus speaking, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. He's talking about spiritual fruit, things coming out of your life that are of a benefit to other people, that are a benefit to God, that are a benefit to other people. Trees don't produce fruit for themselves. They produce fruit for others, right? That's why you would plant a tree. You wouldn't plant a tree so the tree's happy. You plant a tree so that you're happy, so that you get your recommended daily allowance of vitamin C and so forth, right? So this spiritual fruit that comes, Jesus says, pray whatever you desire and it'll be given to you. It's taking into consideration that we're going to pray according to his will, which means that we know his will and we're actively walking in the spirit and doing what he wants us to do. If you've ever walked around in the flesh, you don't pray. <laughs> uh, maybe you don't know this. I'll, I'm sharing this with you at first hand. So I can tell you when I'm not in the spirit of God and I'm not walking in the spirit, reading his word, if I'm not sensing his presence and I'm in a mood, ask my wife. I get in moods. You get in moods? Yeah. Not in here you don't. <laughs> so ask what you desire to be done for you. It's taking into consideration that you're praying according to God's will. In Luke 12, 31 and 32, it says, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat, where you're going to go, what you're going to wear. Uh, you know, the Gentiles worry about all these things. Don't you worry about it. Seek the kingdom of God, which is seek God to be king in your life. That's what it means. The kingdom of God is not something that you inherit once you leave here. The kingdom of God is now within you, Jesus said. It's a place where ever Jesus sits on the throne and he's the king, that's the kingdom of God. So the question is, are you the kingdom of God? It's probably a little philosophical for early in the morning, sorry. But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You see, it is God's will to bless us and to do good. And so we should go to him. And we should ask him, but we have to understand his will. And you can be positive that God wants to answer your prayer. He loves you and cares about you, and he will rush to do such a thing. Confidence, we call this faith, coming by understanding his love for you. It comes when you understand God's love, and then you have this confidence. You can go before God because you know he's not going to browbeat you, beat you up. Uh, maybe that was my son's problem. Maybe he thought I was going to be sarcastic or something, and he didn't want to ask, because they'd say, all right, what are you going to do for me? So maybe that's why he felt that way. So maybe it's my fault. So that's for my son, in case he's watching. <laughs> it says that we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Well, that just makes sense. If you don't know what to do, and you don't know what God's will, why don't you ask him? Who gives to all liberally. That means without end and without limit, and without reproach. In other words, he says, well, what are you going to do for me? Or what have you done for me lately? 
and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. See, you have to have this understanding that God loves you and he's ready to answer you. With no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. In other words, you'll think this one minute and that the next minute. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything of the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And God is not going to answer your prayer in a favorable manner if you're unstable in all your ways. Because what are you going to do? I would not hand a cup of water to my one-year-old grandson. He is unstable in all his ways. And he might be thirsty. But I'm not handing him a cup of water because I know what's going to happen. He's going to go like this. And I'm going to have to clean it up because he doesn't know how or he can't reach a paper towel. So if you're unstable in all your ways and you go before God and say, God, I wish you'd do something about this, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay. That means God doesn't need to move or do anything because you don't really trust him and you don't love him. You have to go with him confident that you know him and that you love him and that he loves you and wants to answer your prayer. Does that make sense? Just, just not. Oh, and... In James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, there's a nice little nugget. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way. And the prayer of faith. By the way, you know it's not the oil and you know it's not the elders, right? It's the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. By the way, that's a guarantee. That's a promise. You want to hold on to that. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. In other words, if this, the cause of the sickness is God's chastisement, God will lift it. But notice what he says after. Confess your trespasses one to another. In the midst of all of this, Make sure you're talking about the things that you're doing wrong and you fess up. You ever have people do that to you? They come to you and tell you the things that they did wrong? You know what they're looking for? They're looking for you to pray for them. They're looking for you to pray over them so that whatever it is, whatever affliction that's going on in their life where God's chastising them, bring them to a place of humility, they want you to help them out with that. Can you do that? Just nod. You know, it's okay. <laughs> there's, there's no social distancing limit on nodding. You can do that. Yes, you should do that. The elders of the church would be the, the natural people to go to. Hopefully they're in tune and they're right with God and they're going to point the right way. They understand the scriptures and they're God's servants. And so you can trust those folks, right? You would hope. You would hope. But you know, we can trust one another. That's why it says to confess your trespasses to one another. You don't have to go to me or one of the elders or anybody else. You could do that to anybody. And pray for one another. You see, it's not just limited to the elders and the pastor. That you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And you probably heard that scripture. But in its context, it's talking about those in the church who are given that authority under God to teach and to lead. You go to them. Or you can go to each other. And you confess your sins one to another so that you might be healed. And you pray for one another. Right? Right? So we pray. Thank you, brother. I wasn't looking over for the shiniest. Now I get it. I feel better. I don't feel alone. Because the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You go, well, I'm not righteous. <laughs> Forget that. Throw that out the window. I do stuff wrong all the time. Well, you're righteous because of what Jesus did. You know that. He took away all of your sins, the ones you haven't even committed yet, by the way, because he said it's finished. The debt is canceled. It's over. You get a clean slate perpetually. Doesn't mean you go out and sin your brains out. It should do something to your heart and produce holiness. So that was a long section. I will go faster. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say you should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. How many of you need some clarification? Just a few of you. Okay, the rest of you can teach me. I'm just kidding. We'll go right through it. Pray 
for your sinning brother is the first thing. If you see your brother, by the way, it's talking about not an unbeliever. It's talking about a brother. This is somebody who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, you have fellowship with, you have an understanding, you have a relationship with God, that they've come to a place where they've confessed their sins, they admit they're a failure, they need God in their life, they need a reborn, a born-again uh, event with God, and they're pursuing Him. So that is the, the proviso. If you see somebody like that, pray for them. By the way, there are several things you shouldn't do for them. If you see somebody sneaking around, somebody with a duplicitous life, somebody's got a secret sin, something. one thing you don't want to do is go tell someone else, hey, did you notice this thing about this person? Did you know? Oh, no, really? Oh, oh yeah. They came to church without a mask. <laughs> it's funny, Matthew 18, it says that if, if somebody sins against you, you go to them. That's the first thing you do. You go to them. You confront them. Nobody likes to do that, though, right? That's one of the more uncomfortable jobs about being a pastor. You go say, hey, what's up with that? The Bible says this, and you're doing this. What's up with that? And I, I don't say it that casually. I just say it quick because I need to move fast. So you see somebody sneaking around, got a secret life, you... You go to them, right? And you tell them because you love them. Anyone who sees a brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death. Well, what in the world is a sin not leading to death? I thought all sins led to death. In fact, the scripture teaches that. Romans 6, 16 and 23 says, Do not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are that one's slaves whom you obey. Whether, to, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. So you see, sin leads to death, right? All sin leads to death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all sins lead to death, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I shouldn't pray for anybody. I'm off the hook. Are you following the logic? This is what cults do. They, they take the scriptures and twist them. So, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm giving you a demonstration of what not to do, which the Bible is there for too, by the way. Like Ananias and Sapphira, being slain in the spirit like that, not something you want. Just figured I'd let you know. So, whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, sin leads to death. All sin leads to death. So what could he possibly be talking about? A sin leading to death, and you don't pray about that. So there are certain things you don't pray about. You guys all understand that from the passage? There are, certain pray, there are certain things you don't pray about. Interesting. Well, I have five possibilities for you that lots of scholars have talked about. And so I'll throw it out there so you can argue with each other later. Number one, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 to 32, there were those who were taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. They weren't waiting for people. They were being selfish and self-centered. And in sin, they were going ahead and eating without everybody. They were, they were, you know, they were, it was a full-blown meal. It wasn't just a cup and some bread. And they were being selfish, and there were people who were gorging themselves and getting fat, and there were people who were hungry who, by the time they got to the table, there was no food. And these people were sinning against God and against their brothers. And Paul says, that's why some of you are weak, you're sick, and some of you have died because the Lord punished them for living in sin. Now, that's a sin unto death, isn't it? A persistent sin where you are against God, where you're against your neighbor, and you don't give a rip about them, and you're being selfish. That's a sin unto death. Well, I could, maybe I shouldn't pray about that. That's interesting. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I'm not sure it's about the elements necessarily as it is the body of Christ. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many are asleep. That's the scriptural word for being dead. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by whom? The Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. You see, there are those saved individuals who get stuck in a sin where they get to a place where they're just not listening their, their neck is stiffened, so to speak. And it says if your neck is stiffened continually, that eventually you'll find it broken and that beyond healing. 
So the Lord will take you home as opposed to you going over the line and becoming unsaved from your saved state, which is impossible. The Lord will take you home because a fool will die before his time. Understand? So that's a sin unto death. It could be that one. Let me throw another one your way. This is number two. In Genesis 9, 6, it says this, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Saying that when you murder somebody, you violate the image of God, and because of that, you forfeit your life. Yes, the Bible teaches the death penalty. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> For some of you who may not have been aware, it teaches very clearly if you take somebody's life, you forfeit yours. Not an accident, by the way, the scripture all talks about that, and thank God for the American government that is largely based upon scriptural principles. Uh, there is a thing called manslaughter, which is if you slaughter somebody and you're a man and you do it by accident, like an axe head flies off your, your axe handle and you kill somebody by accident, you, you don't get the same punishment as somebody who uh, murder one, vehemently kills somebody intentionally. So... Just so that you know. Now, this is a sin that leads into death, isn't it? A sin that leads to death. You murdered somebody, so I shouldn't pray that God forgive you and let you off the hook and you get out and walk the streets, right? That's a sin unto death. Everybody nod your head. So it could be that. Number three, in Matthew 12, 31 to 32, it says this, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Jesus said this on the tales of the Pharisees seeing Jesus heal, and they accused him of using the power of Beelzebub, the king of demons, to heal. And Jesus said, whoa, you just blasphemed the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, and claimed it to be of Satan. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Oh, by the way, when God's constantly knocking on your heart's door and you shut him down and shut him down and shut him down and you die and you have to go stand before him, that's called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit as well, isn't it? The work of God and saying, nah, 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 nah. That could be the sin that leads to death, right? That's eternal death for sure, right? Don't pray about that either. Well, here's number four, in case you're curious. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 to 5 says, And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your, under your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. That's, that's a nice biblical treatment of died. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. That was a sin unto death, wasn't it? He flat out lied, tried to pretend to be something he wasn't. He says, yeah, yeah, I sold the property for X amount, and here it is, the whole amount. And Peter says, that's the whole amount, that's the whole amount. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit and say that this is the whole amount? You kept some and put it in your pocket. And you could have done that, but you didn't have to lie and say, this is the total. So that's what happens when you come into worship and you pretend to be something you're not. You better be careful because you fall into the same category as Ananias and Sapphira. So be careful. You think it's innocent to walk into church, put on a happy face and pretend. Don't do it. Not a good idea. That was a sin unto death. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit, if you will, or lying to the Holy Spirit. And Peter didn't pray for him. Notice he said, you know, I, I pray for you because you're being dishonest. He didn't do that. He says, you're done. And the Lord pulled the plug and they were done. That's a sin unto death, isn't it? But that's only number four. Number five. There are some people that believe this is the sin unto death. It says in Hebrews chapter six, verses four to eight, making of much nightmares for people. It is impossible for those who are once enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And Jesus clarifies 
and then, or I'm sorry, uh, Paul clarifies, or the, the writer of the Hebrews clarifies in verse 7, for the earth which drinks the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful to those whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. This is talking about an apostate situation where you come and understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You have some semblance of faith. You have all the physical uh, manifestations of being a believer and you turn your back on Christ and you go in the opposite direction. And it is a shameful thing. That is a sin that leads to death. And so you have five to choose from, five different scenarios. So which is it? We'll be taking your votes later. I love to do this. Verse 18. You people are so patient with me. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Does that mean you can walk, walk around without a mask? That means if somebody cough in your face <coughs> and they have COVID and you're okay? Because the evil one won't touch you, right? And then you go to the devil, na, 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 na. No. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Hey, how many of you are born of God? Know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior? How many of you no longer sin? Wow, we got, a, we got a biblical issue here. Yeah, Benjamin doesn't sin. He's got his hand up. We know that whoever's born of God does not sin, by the way. The tense is perpetually, continually practice sin. Everybody go, oh. There you go. Thank you. Yes, that's the answer. It's the tense of the, of the verb that you have to understand. So it is this if you're born of God, you don't sin. By the way, being born of God is something that John uses a lot in, the, in his uh, writings. In 1 John 3, 9, he says, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Notice it's the same thing he's saying here at the end. For his seed remains in him. In other words, this God is inside of you, the seed being the Holy Spirit. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. He cannot continue to stay in sin. If you're a believer, you will always perpetually be getting out of sin and being constantly improved. That is a sign that God's in your life. And, you know, the self-help books and all that kind of stuff, you will run out of gas if that's all you have. But if you have the Spirit of God, there is no ending to the amount that you can get better or, or repent of or get more Spirit-filled. And so that is one of the indicators that you're born of God. Uh, 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So one of the earmarks, again, of somebody that's born of God means that they love others. And we talked about that earlier. 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him, who's begotten him. So you'll have love for other people, but you also believe that Jesus is who he said he is. He is the Christ, the Messiah, which means you're broken. He fixes you. You're lost. He finds you. You're empty. He fills you, and there's no other way for you to live a real life and get fixed from the inside out other than him. And in 1 John 5, 4, for whatever, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So we have this family resemblance where we overcome the world. It's, it's not just about the internal issues that are going on where we don't continue to sin on the inside, but the outside pressures of the world don't press us into its mold and we don't look like what the world's trying to tell us to be. I thought it was interesting on MSN, there was a reporter reporting about the COVID and he was at, uh, uh, he was at the beach and he was wearing a mask and he was mocking everyone who wasn't wearing a mask and saying, you know, everybody's out here like this isn't even real. And they have the death counter up on the, on the screen. So many people have gotten COVID and these amount of people have died. And they have it on the screen and he's generating all this fear towards people. And then suddenly the cameraman veers off of the guy and there's, an, there's a guy with his cell phone recording the people who are there, and he's recording the, the film crew and the sound crew and the director, and he goes, yeah, none of you have a mask on. 
The only guy with the mask on was the one generating fear in front of the camera. Understand that the world has an agenda. It's trying to press you into the fear mold. Our lives are not just in our hands, they're in God's hands, right? Yes. I'm not going to be a fool. I'm not going to be an idiot and have somebody cough in my face or handle snakes or do something silly. But I'm not going to worry about when the end of my life is. Unless I'm being an idiot and doing stupid things, you know, driving 120 on my motorcycle or something, I'm invincible. Because until the Lord wants to take me home, I'm in his hands. Amen? Amen. By the way, it goes for you too. So, born of God. It says that when you're born of God, you keep yourself. You don't continue in sin. You keep yourself. That's a rather interesting thing. Do you keep yourself? I took a shower today. Do you? Well, don't answer. Uh, anyway, <laughs> you keep yourself. And 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him, who's Jesus, who called us by his glory and virtue, and by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. And through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Do you realize the promises of God enable you to be a partaker of the divine nature? Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And because we've escaped the corruption of the world through lust, we don't continue to sin. We're always drawing near to the Lord, drawing near to other people, growing in our love for him and for others. That's a, a sign that you're, you're his. And we know this. And I give eternal life to them, Jesus says, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. John 10, 28 to 29. What I know is that I have security in Christ Jesus. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've said, listen, I'll do anything you tell me to do, I'm yours. Rebuild me, remake me from head to toe, and you've submitted your life to him, this is going to be the reality of your life. You will never, ever be able to lose your salvation. Period. 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5 says, we have been... We have been given this inheritance to an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That's better than any safe. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So not only do we keep ourselves, but God keeps us too, doesn't he? In fact, if it wasn't for God keeping us, we'd be done. But there is a responsibility on our behalf. Notice there's two responsibilities. One is God keeps you. Number two, you keep yourself. So it's not like, well, God, you want me to be holy, you can make me holy. I'm going to go do stupid things. No. If you love God and if he's put a seed in your heart, then you can't continue to do that. So we know. This is the third you know, or we know. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Number one, I know that I'm saved. I know that I am born again of God, that I'm his, that I'm his child. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it, but he gave it to me, and I'm going to receive it, and I'm going to make it worth something. Amen? Number two, I understand that there's depravity. The whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. So I realize that I'm in a battle all the time, and it's not flesh and blood that gives me trouble. It's principalities and powers, these, these uh, authorities in high places, these spiritual forces that are going on. We don't do battle. If you think you have a problem with someone, you don't have a problem with someone. You have a problem with a spiritual force. And I, I know you know what I'm talking about because you can feel it. You ever, you ever get overwhelmed with your emotions like you want to kill somebody? Just Mark. Okay. <laughs> There's a spiritual force at work here, boys and girls. Amen. And it's an amazing thing. We get on our knees and we pray and we ask God to, to, to give us a new heart and a new mind. Guess what he does? So if you're trusting in the White House, by the way, do you know which one of those is the White House? Yes. You're so smart. <laughs> you're so smart. I can't stump you. On the $20 bill, it looks completely different than all the pictures I was looking at. And then I, I looked online and I saw one's the South Lawn. Anyway. 
You're right. So one's the front, one's the back. Um, it's interesting. My house doesn't have that look. But it doesn't matter what you're trusting in. Do you trust in the government to fix everything? You, no wonder you're so sad and depressed if you do. <laughs> because government will not fix everything. Do you trust the UN to fix everything? If you do, you're going to be sad and you're going to distrust human beings. Do you trust in Wall Street? That Wall Street's going to fix everything. One little virus levels the joint. <laughs> you can't trust Wall Street to fix anything. Yes, but our president's been doing a fine job and we've, we've had more productivity in our... And one virus, one little teeny microscopic thing changes the whole world, right? So you can't trust in that. Can you trust in Sigmund Freud? He's the guy that made up the Oedipus complex. The, the Oedipus complex is when a young child actually has sexual feelings for their parent. And it's something that exists in everyone, so he says. But the truth of the matter is it really just exists in him. If you know his history. Anyway, I'm sorry. You're going to trust in modern psychology? You're going to trust in the father of psychology to tell you what you to do? You're going to be very disappointed. What about doctors? You know, we really hope that doctors will come up with a cure for everything, and I hope my life would be better, better uh, created by medicine and chemicals, and, and I will live forever, and my hair will never fall out anymore, and I will, I will just grow taller and stronger and leaner and better. And, you know, is that what you trust? Well, good luck, because, by the way, you've got an expiration date. Um, it's written somewhere. And you can't trust money. You think money is not the solution to everything. In fact, it, it adds more problems because you have to take care of it. You've got to direct it. And you'll have to stand before God because to him who much is given, much is required. So these things don't solve anything. So my question is, who's your savior? Who's your savior? If you know that your gods and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, guess what? There's nothing in this world for you that's ever going to complete who you are. It's never going to fill that hole. It's never going to scratch that itch. It's never going to satisfy you with any kind of prolonged satisfaction. It's not going to give you joy. It's not going to give you fulfillment. Only God can do that. Amen? Amen? So we don't reach out for these things. And we know the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true. In the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. Who's the true God? This is the true God and eternal life. Who is eternal life? Who is the true God? Isn't that interesting? You should share this with your Jehovah Witness friends. <laughs> Disturb them. Here's the thing. We know that the Son of God has come in and given us an understanding. You don't think the same anymore. You don't have the same spirit anymore. You have been given everything new. It says here in Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone, admit it, that's who we were, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, which feels and pumps and hurts, and yes, that will all be part of it. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So part of what it is to be a Christian is that you do those things that are the will of God. And it naturally comes out of you because you have a new nature and a new heart. In John chapter 1 verses 16 to 18, it says something rather important. And I went too fast. And this is the fullness we have all received from grace to grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one is seeing God at any time. These are the words of Jesus, by the way. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. You see, because we know Jesus Christ and he's told us about who God is, we have changed by virtue of what he's done, not by our own efforts or our own self-help. It's because of Jesus. He is the only God, the eternal God, is Jesus. And the scripture teaches so, just so that you understand that. Last verse, and a cheer went up. <laughs> little children, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And that's how he closes it out. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 
he's talking to them as Christians. He's talking to them as brothers and sisters and those who know Jesus Christ. I don't know why he would say idols. Uh, no, not those. No, not tikis. What idols? An idol is something when you exchange the created for the creator. It is a flat-out exchange. We see that in Romans chapter 1. Uh, they, they glorified the creator, uh, the, the creation rather than the creator who was ever blessed. It's when you exchange something for someone. When God does not occupy the prominent place in your life, something else does. Just so that you know, that's an idol. And they don't call them idols for nothing. They just sit there. They do nothing. It's, it's when you have an obsessive obsession with something that you have to have. And it's, an, it's giving into an emotion that you just, I, I need to have this thing. Uh, you guys know what obsessive emotions are? I have to smack you, I have to eat that pizza, I have to, you know, an obsession. Um, in, in the uh, other world, we call this the addiction, an addiction of the will. Those things that grab hold of you and suddenly you're a slave of it. These are idols. These are the, th the things that you submit yourself to obey and you become a slave to it. It's either some created thing that God has created, and it could be another person, by the way. I know there are women who worship their children. I know wives that worship their husbands. I know husbands who worship their garage. I, you know, you, it's an idol. It's something that's more important. I know a lot of men who worship their job. It's a little closer to home. There are people that worship their appearance. You know, fill in the blank. It's an idol. It says, keep yourself from idols. The addiction of the will, the obsessive affection, and the exchange of creation for creator. So why do we go to idols? Why are idols so attractive to us? Well, we're sinners and we're in the flesh. We're attracted to those things. They bring a level of comfort. They're easily controlled, you see, because when you submit your life to God who is not seen and certainly is not able to be controlled by you, you have no control. Hey, Lord, I really, 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 really want this thing. Could I have it? You can't control his answer. But if you just reach out and grab something, you can control that, can't you? And so it becomes this choice, this volition, where you choose something, and it's controllable. And so there's comfort in being able to control. That's one of the things with anorexia and bulimia. It's, it's really more about control than anything. But anyway, there's this temporary relief of a desire, but then there's the, always the guilt afterwards. You know what that, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I am so hungry I could eat a horse, so I'm going to try. <laughs> There's this seduction of approval that we need. Sometimes we, we give over to idols because I need other people to like me. You know, so I'm going to wear like cool fashions or I'm going to uh, I'm going to say something that's so smart that everyone uh, appreciates me or I'm going to work so hard that my dad's proud of me or I'm going to whatever it is. We exchange this love that we get from God unconditionally for some conditioned thing that we must do and perform. And so that's why we reach out for idols, because we seek approval, but we don't seek it from God. We seek it from other people. And then the shame of reform. It is very difficult if you have a besetting sin in your life to confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. It's a hard thing to come out with the fact that, man, I fall short and I, I messed up. It's hard. And so what do we do? We go to an idol as opposed to going to God and going to our brothers and sisters and getting it right and getting healed. We just go to an idol. So those are just some of the reasons I kind of came up with as to my own reasons why I turn to things when I do. So what have you missed out most under the quarantine? And you think, boy, what an unrelated question. No. What have you missed during the quarantine? It may reveal to you that there's an idol. If you just said, oh, my goodness, I couldn't go to Macy's. I, I can't stand it. The minute they're open, I'm standing in front of the door. That might reveal that you have an idol. I mean, if, if you're willing to do almost anything, it could be shopping, but you could do that online anyway. Amazon's real good. So what is it that you've missed most about the quarantine? That question 
with the introspection makes you say, what are the important things to me? What did I miss during the quarantine that I wouldn't want to give up? If you say fellowship, I'm with you. And we should never give up on that. As the day approaches, we should do it all the more, by the way. So Romans 8.28 says that we know that in all things work together for good, for those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You know, you might think that the COVID is the worst thing that's happened to the, uh, to the church, but it really isn't. Because what it does is it shakes things up, and the things that can't be shaken are the things that remain. And the things that are so important to us, we realize we could do without. And the things that are important, we learn to appreciate them so that when we have them back, they get special attention, like fellowship. Why don't you guys pray with me? Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the book of First John. So helpful and so um, instructive. And I thank you for your spirit, Lord, which is so convicting about the things that we have yet to submit to you. I pray that you would help us to pray about the things we should pray about and to not pray about the things we shouldn't. That you would help us to know that you're our Savior, that you love us, that we live in a fallen world that's trying to press us into a mold. I pray that you would help us to be overcomers in this world as well, that we would know that you've called us to do that, that we can come before you as a good Heavenly Father and ask and seek and knock and know because of your love for us, not our own worthiness, that you answer our prayers. Lord Jesus, we pray that you help us to keep from idols, that we would place nothing on the throne where you belong, except for you. Help us, Lord, to be fully given over to your purposes and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.